Hello. Good evening, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Um, firstly, thank you all so much for coming down tonight. On behalf of the Economic Student Society of Australia, we warmly welcome you to our first ever inaugural Q&A event. And we are, so, we are delighted to see so many friendly and familiar faces, as well as new faces in this room tonight. I would like to thank our sponsors, the Faculty of Econo Business and Economics, the Department of Economics, the Melbourne Business School, the Commerce Student Centre, and Jumbo Chinese for all their support throughout the year and also for helping us host this event. My name is Karen Lee and I will shortly hand over to Mr Stephen Long to in introduce the panel. But firstly, Stephen is the M ABC's economic correspondent and journalist with more than 22 years experience. So if you will please well, join me in welcoming Stephen and the rest of the panel. Well thank you very much for all being here. Dismal science, what? Look at, look at the faces in the audience. Look at the enthusiasm for economics. It, it actually reminds me of a quote that I read one time who said, which said that economics serves a very useful purpose in providing employment for economics graduates, and we'd all agree with that. We are going to have a Q and A tonight. We're not going to call it Quanda because we're not quite there, but we're going to see what perspectives economics can bring to the debate about immigration and the two-speed economy, multi-speed economy, call it what you will. We have a very, very good panel of distinguished economic thinkers. To my right, physically, if not philosophically, is George Megalogenis, a senior journalist and political commentator with The Australian, an author and a man who's actually invented the term meganomics. And to my left, physically, but I, I would hazard a guess, certainly not philosophically, is Neville Norman, another distinguished economist, consultant to public and private sectors in Australia and economics honours coordinator at the University of Melbourne. Leave your money on the fridge. He, this man's in charge of the honours program. And to the far left, which is perhaps why I didn't survive at Citigroup and various other market, market economics jobs, is Stephen Kakoulis, a, a friend of mine, a former colleague of mine, a former economics advisor to the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, and the founder and managing director of Market Economics, which does some robust methodological research for various entities. We were discussing it before. And... Uh, on the far right of the panel, perhaps appropriately, I'm not sure, <laughs> is James Patterson, Communications Di Director at the Institute of Public Affairs and Editor of the IPA Review, which I'm sure you all read religiously. And between uh, Mr. Mr. Megalogenis and James, we have someone I was very, very pleased to meet tonight whose reputation precedes him, Professor Max Corden, a preeminent international economist and distinguished academic. And Max was saying to me before he arrived that distinguished is not a metaphor for old. <laughs> so we'll kick off tonight with the vexed issue of immigration. It's been in the news with a certain type of immigration of late, but I'd like to pitch the debate a little bit beyond that to start with about what size do we want to have as a population in Australia? George Megalogenis, I was reading a little missive that seemed to have been sponsored as I was on the plane and stuck into the, into the Sydney Morning Herald uh, by, by uh, Dick Smith, the patriotic Australian capitalist, who was arguing that we cannot sustain a large population in this country. It would be a disaster and the growth at all costs mentality that underpins people saying we should increase our skilled migration makes no sense. What would you say? Uh, I'd politely disagree with him uh, for a very simple matter that uh, whatever problem solving Australia needs uh, to engage in the next 10, 20, 30 or 40 years as, as things happen in and around this region, uh, we won't be able to do it without fresh ideas. And it's almost, it's almost a 
uh, almost a starting point for any any open market, open society like ours, that you need more people to bring in fresh ideas. Now, the idea that there's a carrying capacity for the continent and that we can't really push the population beyond... I don't know what Dick's um, problem is with population in the 20 millions because we're certainly heading to the 30 millions by the middle of the, de- by the, middle of the century, whether we like it or not... Um, if you want to freeze population growth, if you want to shut the immigration, uh, if you want to dial it down to zero, uh, what you end up getting is a, is a place that stops growing and stops thinking for itself. Now, it's very hard to win an electoral mandate for that in the long run. I mean, you may be able to get a local council that, that, that stops development. You may be able to get a state government that trials a slower population policy, which Bob Carr did. He declared Sydney full at the start of the last decade, straight after they hosted the best ever Olympics. And look what happened to New South Wales. And in fact, a very funny thing happened in New South Wales when you drill into their, um, into their population story in the last 10 years. Sydney stopped. The state failed, and in fact, to maintain growth, uh, not to increase it, but basically to maintain it, to stop them from falling off the cliff, they actually had to ramp up their overseas migration policy to a level that that they probably didn't have electoral permission for, because everybody else was going to Queensland. Well, I'm going to jump in here, because we have a question from the audience that relates to this, and it comes from George Pagonis. They're just swinging the boom mic down and getting the camera in place. Thank you, panel. Uh, Bob Carr recently said that migration does not relieve skill shortages, but rather it exacerbates them. Does the panel agree to what seems to be quite a counterintuitive claim? Neville Norman. No. I studied this in detail with the Commonwealth Government's uh, uh, population inquiry in the 1980s, and I think there's a general issue about this. Migration is really a long-term thing. I mean, that's what we're looking at. And other than guest workers and so on, guest workers uh, is a fix, and it did work. Turkish guest workers work temporarily in Germany, but mostly you can't. I don't think you can run a guest worker program very well in Australia. And in general, I'm, I'm part of me is tempted to agree. Uh, with the difficulty of that. But when you're thinking migration, you should really think, where do you want this country to be in a date like 2050 or something like that? All these other issues of the short term and so on, I I think, are ephemeral. Now, we're talking about this Butzman economist. I don't know how many people know this. But in 1924, there was a little dispute among two economists. Frederick Benham uh, took one view on the carrying capacity of Australia by 2000. That was a long way off. He thought 200 million people. Stanley Carver said 14 million was the maximum. So this is the little dispute between carrying capacity. And, and somewhere you can in build the middle is their ideal population. <laughs> no, it's closer to the... Well, wherever the ideal is, I don't know. But I refuse to answer the question, where should the number be? Because my view of economics is that economists should keep out of that. If you define the goals as to what you want, if you've got environmental goals, we're already bigger than we need to be. Uh, if you've got gung-ho goals and you don't put as much weight onto the environment, well, you can take a much larger population. And, uh, and any economist who answers that question is either arrogantly presupposing the goals or they are not even being honest. So that's, that's my answer to that one. The question was, uh, how would the panel respond to Bob Carr's assertion that migration doesn't relieve skill shortages but rather makes them worse? Is there anyone who agrees with Bob Carr on the panel? What was his reasoning? I have no idea why Bob Carr said that. It's a one-liner thing to say, though. It's only only correct if you don't have any ability or any willingness to build infrastructure to house and look after these people. If you just have a big chunk of people, a couple hundred thousand, arriving here and you don't build roads, you don't build houses, you don't build schools, you don't build offices and factories and public transport to get them to work and all these other things, it's a problem. But if you've got an immigration policy, immigration's a free lunch uh, for Australia, that if you're getting a large number of, well, a large number of skilled, semi-skilled young people who are coming here who have already had their education paid for by some other country, um, had their uh, formative years in, in other countries and they come here in their 20s, 30s and even 40s, that's, that's a free lunch for us. We, 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 we're um, piggybacking off, off that. And uh, the only issue that I'd have, as I'm alluding to with the car comment, is that if we have an immigration system, 
you've got to make sure that you have the infrastructure to go with yeah. that. And, uh, so, again, it's all, it's all five- and ten-year planning to do it. So if the, state is, if the state is declared to be full, that's not a very good starting point, as Bob Carr did. Um, I'll turn to now to James Patterson. James, if the panel is in agreement that in economic terms it makes sense for Australia to have a larger population, it makes sense in, in terms of the broad political economy of the country, how then do we sell that to a, the Australian public where there clearly is resistance to the idea? Look, it's a very difficult thing to sell the Australian public. Uh, as we saw in the 2010 federal election, one of the most disappointing things was the bipartisan consensus from both political parties that Australia should be small. I thought that was extremely depressing, but it was also pretty popular. Australians are instinctively resistant to immigration. So I think we have to make the economic case better. Uh, there is a fear that immigrants will come and they'll take our jobs. Immigrants do not take jobs when they come to a country. They create jobs when they come to a country. Uh, immigrants add to our economy. They don't subtract from it. More people in Australia is a good thing. But we also have to make the moral case. Uh, immigration is the easiest, cheapest, best way of solving poverty. If an Ethiopian taxi driver moves from Ethiopia to New York without upgrading any of his skills at all, he goes from earning three to $4,000 a year to earning $35,000 a year. Lives are changed by, by immigration, and it's not just the lives of the immigrants that are changed, but it's the people back home. The remittances that immigrants send back from developed countries to developing countries far, far, far outweighs any foreign aid any Western country has ever given or will ever give. They are, it is a great way of fighting poverty in the developing world. And I know that might not be the easiest thing to sell to the masses at large, but one thing we can do to help deal with that is not take the cop out that Bob Carr did, which is not investing in infra infrastructure and then picking a scapegoat in the case of immigrants, but having state governments in particular who take the necessary decisions to invest in infrastructure for a growing country. On the moral issue, we have a, a question which is quite relevant from Finley Roberts. I'm making it very difficult for the man with the microphone by swapping around the ordering of the questions. Go ahead. Hi. Um, my question for the panel tonight is what's the most important type of immigration? Is it skilled, is it humanitarian, or is it the family type of immigration? Thank you. I'm just going to repeat that question because apparently our mics don't pick up the questions from the audience for recording purposes. So which is the most important, humanitarian, family, or skilled migration? Max Corden. Can I first, sorry, <coughs> let me first say that I'm biased on this subject. I am an immigrant. And I don't know whether that was good for Australia. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm mentioning some other thing. Um, is this, can you hear me clearly from this? Um, <clears throat> when I came back from the United States about uh, 11 years ago, uh, I immediately found myself comparing a lot of American things with Australian features. And, and America is, of course, a great country of immigration over a long history. And I noticed that Australia seemed in some ways to be following the same directions. So I did some study on the subject. And when I was asked to give a lecture at the Productivity Commission, I gave it on the subject. And I recommend you to read the paper, which is on the web. And this is the title. And you can get it by just typing the title into Google. And it's called 40 Million Aussies, question mark, the immigration debate revisited. And in there I have all the arguments that you've been hearing, pro and con, and on balance I certainly come out in favour of a higher population. Now there's so many things can be said, but let me just pick up one little thing. I saw a film uh, produced or sponsored by Mr. Dick Smith, who has that famous uh, store that we all like to go to. And he, his complaint was, he was an anti-immigration person, uh, that the cities were overcrowded, thinking of Western Sydney and perhaps Melbourne, that the traffic, uh, there was a lot of people in the trains, uh, elementary problem of, uh, of traffic arrangement, of, of transport. And it's quite ridiculous uh, when you think about it. People choose to live in the cities in spite of the different transport, and the people who run the cities are not providing adequate services. Does that mean, therefore, Australia should not have more people? I mean, why not uh, people can live in Canberra? Canberra has all the facilities and could have a million people without difficulty. <laughs> Uh, where people have chosen to live in Western Sydney and the suburbs of Melbourne. But the general point I'd like to make is this. If we're going to have more population, 
as I, most of us here seem to agree, it is necessary that some, certain things should be dealt with. Adequate infrastructure, town planning, adequate town planning, plan in advance of the people settling. Um, and uh, another issue that I discuss in my paper is water supply. I, th I thought at first, when I first tackled the subject it, 10 years, 12 years ago, that that would be a serious constraint on uh, population growth. But actually, and I started re reading it, and I'm not an expert in this field, but a very high proportion of all the water is consumed by irrigation, not by the cities. Mm. Very high proportion. Mm. I mean, it's quite amazed me, actually, that particular fact. And uh, that the central problem of water is simply pricing it correctly. And of course, here's a typical economist approach. Price it correctly. Same with this, uh, this traffic arrangements. Price, charge people a bit more for getting into the city at certain times, and we solve those problems. So these are all peripheral issues, but certainly they should be dealt with, particularly if we're going to have growth in population. Just one other thing I'm allowed to... So if we, if, we, if we take the water back from the whinging farmers who are getting it for a ridiculously low price in the irrigation areas, we could free it up to, to have a higher population, problem partly solved. Well, I, I won't agree with you calling whinging farmers whinging, because some of my best friends are farmers. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Doesn't stop them whinging. But I, I, yeah. uh, well, look, they are, have every right to look after their interests, and maybe they ought to be compensated. In the, I'm thinking particularly of the Murray-Darling Basin issue. Yeah. Max, I'm going to bring you to the the terrible nub of what I saw as a difficult question because there's actually a pointed edge to this question from F Finley Roberts uh, and it asks for a diabolical choice. Which is most important to Australia? Humanitarian immigration, family reunion or skilled migration? Why do we have to choose... Yeah, exactly. I mean, have some of each, but I must. Say, I have a well, bias. We're free to choose, aren't we? Yeah, just appreciate. To a well, I mean, I personally have a, but it's purely personal. I have a bias in favour of humanitarian. Uh, at the margin, I would rather see an extra ten thousand or twenty thousand humanitarian. But that's not. I'm not speaking as an economist here. I'm just speaking as a human being. I'm going to ask Neville Norman to speak as an economist and give an answer to the question. Well, you've stymied me. I'm castrated by that response. The, there's no way I can answer that as an economist because I've already told you. Um, you've got to get public goals. But the problem with the question is about Australia. There is no one Australia. Thank God we are a really diverse thing. And the answer is all of those things are important and the weights will be different to different people. I personally, I'm going to take my hat off uh, as economist and say the humanitarian thing is really important but then I'm not going to let that interfere with doing my economics. The main thing in the economics is some of the arguments put up are just absolute rubbish. What we found in the 1980s, massive research, 30 research teams, the idea that uh, higher immigration at a steady sustained rate raises unemployment rates was debunked by every possible study as it went. Now mm -hmm. going back to the question uh, about how we get this across, Non-economists are suckers for the fixed pool argument. Mm -hmm. That is, that there's a fixed pool of jobs, more migrants right. takes them away and that's it. And the Bob Birrells of the world just <laughs> play on that and they know they're playing on it. But for the economics trained, it's even worse because they are indoctrinated with standard economics of the stationary state where immigration can only make things worse. It's a Pareto fall. So this is the problem. You've got to break that down both in economics and non-economics. But my personal answer to the question is that all of those things are important and Australians will have different answers. And that's why we have a government to listen to this and take decisions. So, like it or not, if you believe in democracy, you have to handball this to the government and 90% of the people will think they're wrong, but 100% of the people, I think, will realise that the alternative system doesn't work, and that's totalitarianism. So you're going to get this vigorous debate because any answer to this question about which is important is going to be disagreed by the vast majority of people, and that's the way it needs to be. George Megalogenis. Yeah. In the composition, and the question is about the composition of the intake, uh, so let's, let's assume uh, we fix the number in any given year. In the short term, you probably favour skilled over everything else just to plug whatever gaps you've got in your labour market in the short term. But the longer term question is the, is the quality of your citizen, not just their economic contribution, but their contribution as a citizen. 
Now, we've got ourselves into this, uh, into this short-termism in, in our political system and the trap of thinking that an immigrant should land in Australia fully formed, the free lunch argument, and that somehow that is a, a more acceptable immigrant than somebody who comes from an impoverished background. Because coming out of the Second World War, people did not measure the value of the immigrant on the day of arrival. The best way you could measure the value of the immigrant, and there have been studies to this effect, is in the, is in the um, education achievements and the professional achievements of the Australian-born kids. Now, the second generation of non-English speaking uh, parents tend to do better, other things being equal, than anyone else. There's a bit more drive there. They also, they also are less likely, I think, to want to jump ship and go looking for the green card, which is what this skilled stream may be thinking in the long run if the Americans ever get off the floor. So if you're thinking about long-term interests, uh, your composition would be weighted towards the people who want to have a crack and that is the people coming from an impoverished, um, from an impoverished area. We've got about two to three generations wor worth of uh, very hard evidence that it works. We've, we've switched the experiment now in the last 10 years or so to go for the skilled, to ignore some of the issues with, with, with the local population. They're filling jobs that maybe we're not, um, we probably don't have a sufficient labour supply that's, in, that's um, qualified enough to fill some of these jobs. Well, in the long run, I think you'd be aiming to increase the skill set of your local board population and looking to draw people who want to be Australians. Now, that's an economist thinking there, but it's also uh, testing the, the separate issue of the citizen. Who on the panel is an immigrant or is the son of immigrants? Well, there's, there's George Megalogenes, Stephen Kikoulis, there's me. So, and the audience, I'd just like a straw poll of the audience. Who here is an immigrant or, or a first generation uh, child of immigrants? Look, that is nearly Three our points. entire audience. Now that says something, doesn't it, about here. the contribution? <laughs> although, although, you, although your total population is a bit under half, first or second generation, so we're, we're not representative here. Okay. Could I come uh, Could I have one word in? Yep, yeah. yeah, sure. Could I just have a word on this? Um, <clears throat> I, as I told you, I did a study of this subject uh, 10 or 12 years ago in this reference I gave you, and I just wanted to tell you about one or two things. Uh, immediately after the war, the government uh, carried out a big immigration program, and the big man who started all this was Arthur Caldwell. Now, the motivation was to do with defence, really. Yes? Uh, publish, uh, not, uh, populate or perish. Uh, and they, at that stage, people did not want non-British migrants. They just wanted British people. That's why they were subsidised to come, you know, the £10 pond and all that sort of thing. Well, it turned out the government couldn't get enough British people. They did bring, for example, um, our present Prime Minister came under that scheme. She came from Wales, you see. And then finally they decided to bring in people from other countries, particularly from southern European countries, namely Greece, Italy and Yugoslavia. Later, 10 or 15 years later or more, we had a lot of Vietnamese brought about under the Malcolm Fraser government on the basis of humanitarian motives. Well, now years have gone by and we were able to see the consequence of those uh, immigrants. In each case, there was a lot of opposition, and there was uh, opinion polls were rather uh, not happy with all these Greeks. Mm. And, uh, I'm, Max, and, I'm going I'm yeah. to jump in here yeah. because we have <laughs> yeah all these Greeks. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in here because we have a question from the audience, which is directly relevant to the, one of the points that you made about Malcolm Fraser. And the question comes from I'm not sure if it's Janus or Janus. Suasis? Is that you? You have to forgive me if I've mispronounced that. Yanni. Thank you. Another Greek. <laughs> Beware of Greeks bearing questions. Yeah. My question is, if if governments in Australia today would act in the same way as Malcolm Fraser did so in the 1970s, with thousands of Vietnamese refugees were seeking asylum in Australia. Stephen Kukulis. Well, they're having trouble doing it. I think uh, if they wanted to, they could. And uh, look at the debate that's going on right now, uh, which is really depressing. It's a, it's a very sad situation that um, the humanitarian aspect of the immigration intake is just dreadful. Politically, it's impossible. One of the things um, that you learn... You know, 
I learned a lot in my only 10 months working in the Prime Minister's office. It was the most eye-opening experience of my life. And the constraint on decision-making is huge. Not just, not just the difficulty of where's the money coming from and those sorts of things, which of course are important in the, in the balancing of budgets and all these other things, but given our electoral cycle is only three years, given that it's so easy now for a noisy group of people to scare everybody about these sorts of issues, things don't get done, or they actually get done the wrong way. Now, ob obviously, uh, at a time when there's some bad crap going on in the world, people are running away to save their lives, they're not coming here for fun. Uh, they're, they're, they're running away from their circumstances, or in, in, in recent years, from uh, uh, countries in the Middle East, from Sri Lanka and other places. And, and here we are, sort of, as a population, uh, resisting them from coming here. It's yeah. just, a, just a few thousand, and I think that's really bad. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's, there's any desire for uh, that to change. It is not the nub of this that the relative consensus that we had in the Fraser period has broken down, and, right. and we had a long period where the dog whistle was blown. And now this has become a political football, and there is, there is really no consensus on it, George. Yeah, well, the political consensus broke, but I think, and Max alludes to this, it was ever thus in the real world. There was always a resistance to the next wave. Um, and in fact, a lot of the Greeks will tell you that the 70s and 80s were, were sort of a little transition point where they didn't feel like wogs anymore because the Vietnamese were the new target. And then they started using the word and then everyone got bored with the word um, by about 2000. So what's actually changed is not... Public, public opinion hasn't changed at all. And I'll give you... Max alluded to one of the polls. The Greeks were 10 to 20 per cent less popular in the early 50s than the Germans were straight after the end of the Second World War. <laughs> That's news, are we back well, think in about, that think about territory what, now, globally, yeah, well, with think what's about, happened in Europe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so the problem is up there. It's at the political, it's at the leader level. It's not down here. Down here, it was ever thus. OK. Now, we've got a very interesting question on the Twitter feed from Quist Christopher Weinberg, which says, can we learn anything from the experiences of other Western economies and their handling of economic humane immigration. I think we've partly answered that by saying perhaps we could learn a little bit, bit about the way we handled it in Australia in decades gone by. But James Patterson, do you have a perspective on that? Are there examples overseas of where countries have done it better? Well, actually, Australia is amongst one of the best countries of wor in the world for welcoming and accepting immigrants. There are very few countries that have such a high proportion of people born overseas. Uh, it's basically us, Canada and Israel. Other than those four countries, uh, you find all around the world very low proportions of immigrants and, and children of immigrants. Um, there are some amazing stories from around the world. I, I think Israel is one of the standout cases. Uh, Post-World War II, they integrated people from uh, an amazing array of backgrounds and languages uh, and built them into a co cohesive nation. That was a very difficult thing to do, and, and, and they did it with an you know, explicitly pro-immigration policy. But then on the other side, you've got the United States, which um, now is, is closing up on, on the immigration front and making it more difficult to, to, to go to the United States. But for a century, basically didn't have immigration policy, basically didn't have a view on who should come there and who shouldn't come there, and, uh, and didn't, didn't talk about it, and it wasn't a national policy issue. Um, so, I mean, I, I long for in, those in the days. In sense that they were relatively open. It was an open... Everybody That's right. Everyone yeah. came. Everyone yeah. came. Um, but Australia does have this issue in that we are an island, so we have an expectation that we can control our borders that few other countries have. Uh, nobody seriously expects, although they sometimes naively hope, that you can control the flow of immigrants in and out of a country like the United States because it's got huge borders with other countries. Uh, and Europe, obviously, you can't. But in Australia, we're surrounded by water, so we have this idea that we can control our immigration, and Australians have this expectation. So we do have to be careful that we meet Australians' expectations that immigration is happening on our terms in the way we want it to happen and that we're not responding to or being forced to accept immigrants. I think that's taking a really strong pro-immigration stance at a federal government level helps uh, get that message across that we are controlling our immigration system and we are welcoming immigrants because we choose to and we want to. I'll turn that question on its head, if I can, just for 30 seconds, because you can look at the, 
poorly performing countries with declining per capita GDP and the like, so uh, J Japan and uh, uh, some of the European economies, Germany, whatever, where they've got zero population growth and, and very low levels of immigration. Spain. They're the ones that run, it's, yeah, Spain, they're the ones that are under huge economic pressure because they just don't have a, you know, partly because we're all living, living longer, that we're all getting older and more, we're really expensive once we get past, you know, 80 years old to look after. Um, but also there's just no population growth. So the countries that are, uh, have well, got... wasn't directed personally at no, you. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the premise but, of the but, question's but, wrong because yeah, sorry, there's hardly any it, countries... Yeah. I mean, you look at Western countries, you could name 30, 40 Western countries. There's only three of them that have yeah. got net migration gain. It's like yeah. putting 15 people in a room, yeah. of whom 14 are male, and say, what can you tell us about motherhood? OK. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to move it along. <laughs> I'm, and, and, and I'm sure you'd have 14 men venturing an opinion. <laughs> now... If I could move it along, the pointy edge of the immigration debate has been the debate about asylum seekers, and we've got a pretty tough question on that topic from Joan Wu. Okay. Um, so, panellists, should Australia close down its detention centres? Thank you. Lady. James Patterson. The problem that we have is that uh, Australians are only willing to accept a certain amount of immigrants. There will always be more immigrants who want to come to Australia than the Australian community will tolerate. And if ever you have a small number of positions and a larger number of aspirants to those positions, there has to be some sort of orderly way of deciding who among those people get it. So unfortunately we have to make the choice about worthiness. We have to say, this immigrant is more worthy than that immigrant. Now, I would much rather a situation where we didn't have to make that choice. But given that we do have to make that choice, we have to have an orderly system for doing so. Unfortunately... But, but locking, locking people up in the desert or housing them in facilities on, on an island that's basically made out of bird poo for years <laughs> is a pretty brutal way of putting in a form of economic rationing, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I, I agree it is definitely brutal and, and, and not preferable. Um, uh, I think once people pass very basic health and security checks, there's no reason why they can't be released into the community while their claims for, for asylum are, are better assessed. But I think the Australian people would find it very difficult to accept that having passed no checks at all on health and security, that people were released into the community. I think you would find popular support for immigration would fall even below what it is now, and we, I'm very we're, concerned We're talking about weeks, that. though, for that style of check I agree. not years. Agree. I absolutely agree. OK. George, uh, what do you think of that question? What do you think of that? Should we close down detention centres? OK. To clarify, we're talking about every detention centre in our name, including the ones offshore? Um, or are we just talking...? OK. The question for me... In, in the last few years, and I really don't understand... In, in one respect, even though I've covered politics for close to 30 years, I don't understand the brain snap we've been having uh, routinely on asylum seekers because this is something that both sides of politics need not contest. Uh, what I understand uh, from the public reaction in the last few days and a uh, uh, good friend of mine who's in, who's in the uh, research space says the take-out message from Middle Australia is thank God that debate is over. There's no win or loss. They just don't want people to be wasting their time on it again, which I can interpret if I were running the country and I'd never, I'd never stand. But if I were running a country, I, I, I'd, I'd take the indifference of the electorate, in fact, the loathing of this debate, as something that I could use to fix this problem in another way. I take it off the table, convince my opponent to take it off the table, because in the long run, no one can win this debate because every vote gets counted as a failure. Now, the problem Australia's got, and this is, a region, this is a regional problem, if it offered to clear the camps in Indonesia, the Indonesians probably, whilst they'd like us to do it, wouldn't want us to declare it on their behalf because then they'd get many more people. So there's a, there's, there's a very pragmatic difficulty here, and that is at some point, and this is relationship between countries in the region that will resolve this in the long run, uh, at some point Australia has to be a bigger neighbour, like a bigger citizen, prepared to take many, many more people, because this isn't Indonesia's problem, it isn't Malaysia's problem, it's Australia's problem. People want to come here, we're in the best position. Anyway. We brag nine times out of ten about our world-beating economy, but on the, on the one-tenth of the debate when people say, well, all right, I'm up for it, can I come? And we say, no, we have to prove that we're brutal as well. I really don't understand that side of it. But, as a, but I think you've got to think your way past the, the detention regime, doesn't that a deterrent? 
and in fact it's a different world from 2001 and this is something this government has found to its detriment but it didn't in a way it didn't see these numbers coming and the civil disturbance in, in um, or the civil war in Sri Lanka obviously wasn't something that was on anyone's radar when uh, the detention regime was eased but uh, look in the long run uh, wouldn't be locking anyone up uh, I'd be looking to get as many people here as possible uh, in a way to stop people taking the second trip because that's really what this debate's about been very interesting. I'm going to move on now to our second topic, the two-speed economy. Some say the multi-speed economy. Cameron Klein, the NAB boss, has called it a, a ten-speed economy. It's getting like one of those cycles that they ride in the Tour de France. We might be up to the 21-speed economy soon with, with electronic levers moving it around. But the reason we've got to this debate is because of the mining boom. Roy Chan has tweeted a question which is, what can Australia do to continue its economic growth, growth when and if the mining boom ends? And let's discuss that, but start with the idea, how long is the mining boom going to last, and is it indeed on the wane, Stephen Kukulis? It's not on the wane. Uh, we might be getting less, a lower price for our stuff over the next 10 years as the global supply of iron ore and coal and natural gas is increased, so we're going to be exporting lots and lots and lots of it. The capital investment, the pipeline that we hear from Treasurer Swan uh, of CapEx on the mining sector is still running along for the next, I don't know, five or ten years. You think about it for a second that some of these big, the Gorgon project and some of these other big projects in Western Australia or whatever, uh, once they start they can't be finished. If you think about some other forms of business investment such as IT, you have a bank, they change all their systems, their IT systems, and it's done and finished. If you're building a, an iron ore mine or a natural gas processing centre, whatever you call them, you start that project, you're going to finish it. You've got years and years and years of work to go. But and the other thing is, these things aren't even producing any iron ore and coal or natural gas yet. There's going to be several years before these things come on stream, so our export performance is stunning. We're talking there but about the, price will come down. the issue yeah. of, of whether it continues to be a boom as such. We may have a continuation of mining, but what's going to happen to the prices? What are the implications for the economy? Neville Norman. Mm. Well, I've been in this debate for a very long time. So has Max Corden, who's uh, involved in that. My uh, judgment is we're going to be dealing with this thing uh, for another five to ten years. I've got a very optimistic view of China. And remember, there's been very little physical volume movement. This boom is very largely a price boom when you look at it. But it doesn't matter. It's, revenue goes up, exchange rate affects everything else, whether it's price or volume. And indeed, if we could solve some of the industrial and institutional problems, which are still there, uh, the volume boom could uh, come with the price boom. You look at individual commodities, there's a f if we, all of us have little doubts about where some things are going with that. But I think the best working assumption is it's going to continue. It will do damage to some sectors. It will have positive effects to other sectors. As a matter of English, two-speed economy is an absolute non-secretary. If you've got a bike going two speeds at the same time, you better get off it because <laughs> you're going to have a really splitting sensation. Um, <laughs> the, the essence, though, is that we have economy with parts moving at differential growth rates. It always was, but it's been accentuated at the moment. And I think we should talk at the implications of it, but this is the good place to start with to go. And I think... Um, we should hear from anyone who thinks it's about to collapse. I don't, and I've got my reasons for it, but I'd like to hear that because we should respect other opinions. Well, there are those who think that the problems in Europe will play out ca catastrophically, that that will kill demand for Chinese exports, and that, indeed, the mining boom, as we understand it, will collapse in the short run. We're not talking about the end of the rise of Asia but there are those who think that we could actually see a situation where we get a dramatic drop-off in prices and demand. Let's assume the possibility of that happening. What are the implications for Australia's economy, for the federal budget, George Megalogenis? This, this is on the assumption that you'll get a, a, a shock yeah. pointing south. You'd have to say it's, it's at least a possibility. Uh, well, 
We've got a floating exchange rate, so the dollar will adjust, and the other nine-tenths of the economy might breathe a little easier. In fact, it's not, it's not such a diabolical scenario if, uh, if, uh, if your terms of trade shifts against you. I mean, the thing, and I'm taking back a step, the difficulty at the moment in the real economy for a lot of businesses is that we're getting, we're, this is a positive, a positive income shock, the likes of which we haven't seen, and there's a huge restructure coming out of the GFC. Most other societies have, tried to, have basically tried to reset their expectations down by 30%. We've got that a bit in the household sector coming out of the GFC, but we've still got this big positive income shop coming in over the top of it, which basically says the price, the price of the quarry is the only price the economy really wants to, wants to hear. Every other price in the economy is, uh, is not a good one. Now, if you, think about, if you think about what the dollar's done, it's made a lot of industries have to confront their almost instant mortality. And... Uh, so become more efficient. Become more efficient. I think, hope, hopefully, well, more efficient or die, as long as the government doesn't get in the way and trying to bail out the sectors that it thinks should be winners in the long run, sectors that probably have already declared themselves as losers. In fact, the more they ask for money, I'd suspect, the more I can guarantee you they're going to fail in the long run. Um, look, if there's a shock in the short term, I, the way we're set up at the moment, we're actually a lot better than people, uh, people give us credit. The rest of the world is lining up to lend us money at rates that we've never seen before. The 10-year bond rate is below 3%. Basically, the rest of the world is handing us money. It's betting on us to win. Um, so if you have a bit of a, 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 a you know, if I was the government, I'd, uh, I'd definitely park a lot of this money and start doing some very quick cost-benefit analysis on big infrastructure projects because no one's going to ask for the money back. Um, just, so, you know, I'm not that, I'm not I'm that just, fussed about a, about, a, I, about a dip. I just want to ask a question, and I'll throw it perhaps to Max Corden about why is the Australian dollar remaining at these relatively high levels when we've actually seen commodity prices come off? <clears throat> well, there's a special fact at the moment, isn't it? We're becoming a little bit of a Switzerland. That's just every one of the countries who's, um, who, who look good in the world of um, financial market and people are getting out of euros into um, respectable currencies. There are not that many of them around, and the Australian dollar is, is one of them. That's the explanation for the current situation. That's temporary, I'd say. And um, it's probably a good thing, but it, it can go too far. Now, just as a matter of fact, interest, I've taken a look at the Swiss economy. Uh, they have brought their interest rate down to 1% in order to moderate the uh, exchange rate effect. But it hasn't, they haven't been able to reverse it, but it's, it's limited. And you could make a case that in Australia, uh, we could um, possibly um, lower interest rates even more, which will tend to moderate the exchange rate effect. I, I, I'm going to jump in here because Dean Pagonis has a question uh, that relates to what we should try to do about the Australian dollar. Dean. The boom mic is swinging down, the camera swings into place, and Dean is here with his question. <laughs> so my question is related to the high Australian dollar. So the high terms of trade has been one of the major reasons that the Australian dollar now sits at around 105, 106. However, the terms of trade have come down recently, around 15%, with no real change to the exchange rate as a result. Now, there have been calls recently from Professor Warwick McGiven from, from ANU for the RBA to interfere in currency markets as he argued that the dollar is being pushed up by financial flows and is hence overvalued. Should the RBA interfere in the market and does this set a dangerous precedent? Neville Norman. Yes and yes. Um, <laughs> Thanks, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> but if they do, I hope they interfere better than they've done with interest rates because it's a global financial crisis. They've been Johnny-come-latelys and most of the discretionary movements have been... Uh, uh, while well, the time there lags of the effects push it in the other direction. Uh, look, it's a matter of philosophy. Uh, my real answer is no and no, but uh, I thought yes and yes and get attention. Uh, <laughs> once you start intervening in this, you've got to have some rules to work with it, and when you make mistakes, it'll be the last time they'll be allowed to intervene as such. I don't think it's very likely, because the Reserve Bank Act 1959, under which they govern, uh, makes them independent. They've been even more independent as such. If they were to intervene uh, like this, what would they do? OK, they, uh, they would have to make some discretionary currency movements. They'd have to, uh, as it were, sell the Australian dollar to try and you know, have a particular 
effect on it. And then there's all sorts of speculation coming with it. No, I think it's a really dangerous strategy as such. It's taken us 25 years to realise that the old system of intervention was a disaster. Economists like Max Corden were going papers and papers about it. In 1983, we got to a floating exchange rate after the Troika. No, I think uh, the, the intervention would be a total disaster, and certainly if run by the reverse bank. Stephen uh, Kukulis, was, was Julia saying, was Julia saying, why can't the bloody Reserve Bank do something about the high Australian dollar in quiet um, moments? And yes, and yes. Uh, <laughs> she still is, as I understand it, she still is. And look, the, w one thing that we've learned in the last five years and from the GFC is that uh, markets aren't always perfect. Now, I think most of us here would agree that 99 out of 100 times you let markets sort themselves out, but with the way that low dock loans were structured, the uh, CDOs were structured, the way that the um, markets tore down the global economy and the global banking system four years ago is that there is a case for occasionally when you observe a market failure to perhaps do something about it. And okay, I don't know what the true level of the US dollar should be. No one does. The Reserve Bank doesn't know, but sometimes you know that that's not right. You know, sometimes you can sort of observe things like um, you know, the Sydney Swans on the top of the AFL letter, that doesn't look right. They're not, they're not going to win. So something's got to go wrong. You look at the dollar relative, as you mentioned, to the terms of trade decline, and you say, look, there's a, there's a cost of it. You know, if, the do if the terms of trade were where they were 12 months ago and the Aussie dollar was at 106, you'd say that's fair value. The world has moved on. And so what do you do about it? The point is, should we do anything yeah, about well, it? Yeah, well, I think we should, yeah. Uh, the what question, the you do what? Well, yeah. sell, sell the dollar. You've got, uh, you can print them all and sell them. We, we're, we're confronting this position from... A point where the inflation rate's 1.2 per cent. I might have a different answer if our inflation rate was three or four, and I, I might, I might not too. But when you're getting this currency squeezing your economy uh, so dramatically and putting a disinflation bias in your whole economy, I'd take a chance. And, and look, if it doesn't work, what's the cost? What's the cost? Because all you've done, you've accumulated a whole lot of US dollars, euros, and yen. And um, we, we've got a follow-up question from Dean Pagonas. Well, what I'll, well, what I'll actually like, can, I, can, I, can, I just, can I just jump in here? And this is the point, and Max could make this more eloquently than me. But for basically, the great economic reform project was to take the price off the cabinet table of the exchange rate, of interest rates, tariffs, and of wages. So basically, those four big prices have come off the table, and it, and it was a very, very painful process. It precedes in most of our corporate memories, and uh, there was a lot of work went into it. We've seen the thing work for the last 20 something years. We suddenly get a price we think looks weird, and we want to and we want to hop in again. Um, I mean, maybe the RBA should short the currency and then give us give but us a, that's, give that's us give us a bonus. Yeah, you know, that's I know, and, get, and, then, and, then, and then and then and then just dole out the. I can't see the. What, so what happens if the thing goes to one fifteen? They've got a mark to market valuation. They lose five billion. Who cares? Okay. It's <laughs> James, not a fund manager. Yeah. James Patterson, do you think that the that uh, the Reserve Bank should even exist, let alone <laughs> here in this? <laughs> <laughs> That is a debate for another night. Uh, a very interesting theoretical debate, but not a practical one. Um, I just want to come to something Stephen said, which is we've learnt in the last few years that markets aren't perfect. Uh, one of the other things we've learnt in the last few years, if we didn't already realise it, was that governments aren't perfect either. And placing the power Placing the power to set our currency back in the hands of governments, I think, is an extremely risky thing to do. Yeah. We are talking, we are placing about, the enormous bank, We're talking about the Reserve Bank. We're talking about the Reserve Bank. And the people at the Reserve Bank are very smart people, but they're also a small group of people. And as Frederick Hayek said, we have an information problem. They cannot possibly possess all the information they need to know to set the right rate of currency. How do they know what the right fair exchange rate for oh, Australia just put is? put a news poll on the field and maybe they get it right. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Sorry. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. We've got we've got a couple of interesting questions on on the Twitter feed. Matthew Weiss says, "Is Australia effectively allocating revenue from the mining boom towards infrastructure for the one-speed future?" I'm not sure I know what that means, but maybe someone on the panel does. I just want to make a quick point about this two-speed economy. Um, a two-speed economy is obviously a generalisation, and, and nobody who says we have a two-speed economy literally means we have a two-speed economy. But even as a generalisation, I think it's a terrible one. We have 2.1 million businesses in Australia. We have a 2.1 million speed economy. Um, there are differences between industries. There are differences within industries. The idea that we have this one booming part of the economy and this one slow part of the economy, and all we need is some really smart policymakers to adjust the levers here and there, and then we'll have an even speed economy, is completely ludicrous. We have never been able to do that. We will never be able to do that. 
that. The idea that we can have everybody growing at the same rate is, is completely complete fantasy and very dangerous. Uh, who knows what... The, the government can't foresee the future. It doesn't have a crystal ball. Maybe they think that it's a good idea to slow the mining boom down right now, but they might not feel that same way in six to eight months' time. Who knows where the global economy is heading? I would much rather have a booming sector of the economy which is doing well and, and meaning Australia is not in the position of Europe and, and elsewhere in the world, rather than, than slow it down in the hope it's going to protect some failing industries. Yeah. No, just one quick... One Question make, here. make it quick because I do yeah. want to. We've got a and, and, I'm, and I want to tease out the thought earlier that Max made. It is is the problem that the currency we suspect it's overvalued and it's forcing too quick an adjustment in the rest of the economy. And then maybe what you're trying to do is is slow the adjustment down, but not stop it, the adjustment. I just I just wonder if I could put the question that way to you. No, no, I'm, I'm throwing it. I'm just yeah. taking your job. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 No, I'm, yeah. I'm just interested in. Um, Time for intervention, Chairman. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Damn journalist. Yeah. I wasn't listening properly. Uh, well, my general, let me put my general view on this other thing. If we think we're in a great, wonderful boom, that's the time to save, for the nation to save. Private people and the government run surpluses, right? Uh, and that will involve uh, low, the, say, say the less spending means you lower interest rates. The central bank has to lower interest rates, and the lower interest rates will then automatically moderate the appreciation of exchange rates. Uh, because if we think we're in a boom, the question is, do we think it'll go on forever? Well, the well, chances are no. The, the treasurer makes the point that we may be in a mining boom, but we have not actually been in a revenue boom for various reasons. And we do have a question that relates to that from Duncan Wallace. Uh, in 2001, mining profits were just under 15 billion and uh, mining tax revenue was about 4 billion, whereas in 2009, uh, mining profits are up to 90 billion and mining tax revenue is only up to just under 10 billion. Uh, and I think that trend's continued into 2012. Uh, I disagree with uh, Neville and Stephen uh, with regards to China being a bubble. Uh, I think there's 64 million homes in China that they can't sell because there's no demand. They've built two cities uh, that no one wants to live in. Um, so with regards to that, it looks like the okay. China bubble will soon pop. Shift, shift on, keep going with the question, Duncan. Um, <laughs> so basically my question is, given that the uh, new resource rent tax uh, might not net the government that much money, is this just another illustration of the power that business has over politics in Australia? Well, you were in the office when, when yeah, uh, we were dealing with the fallout of the power of business over That's politics, Stephen Kukoulis. Yes, it, it is. It, it's, a, it's a massive issue. And again, it comes back to even a, a lot of the public policy problems PPP, uh, that are um, around uh, because of the power of lobby groups, be it immigration issue that we were discussing earlier, be it mining taxes, be it pricing carbon. Industrial uh, relations in, and the union in, movement. In, industri yeah. All of these things. Yes, there's, incre there's incredible power and it makes it very, very easy for the lobby groups to mobilise and argue against things and they can put quite a compelling argument when they get the 20 second grab on the Channel 7 News or whatever. It's, it's not on ABC, they have very good quality news there. But um, <laughs> the issue is that it's, it's, it's really hard and, and, and the, the mining tax has been uh, a debacle, well, it's well, not it raising revenue. It was more than the 20 second grab, it was or the, the 100 million ads, yeah. dollar spend on, adver on yeah, very effective yeah. advertising, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's, a it's a big problem. So uh, my, my fear from this current position, maybe it'll change if someone gets a thumping majority in the, after the next election, is that there will be a period where it'll be very hard for anybody to do something that's good for the economy because inevitably doing something that's good for the economy always involves some costs and it's the people who suffer from the costs that are noisier than the people who, ben who benefit from the benefits, if you like. Like, like. like the motor industry now. You know, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be making cars here. It's, it's ridiculous. We should just let them suffer. James Patterson, to reinterpret the question, it's effectively saying that the government hasn't been in a position because of the power of the mining lobby to actually levy, levy a tax or, or a royalty, whatever you want to put it, at the federal level to actually give us the income that the public should be getting from the exploitation of a public resource. Is that not a fair comment? 
well, the Constitution is very clear on, clear on this. Uh, mining resources belong to the states, and the states levy royalties on mining companies for the privilege of mining the iron ore and gold and whatever else. Uh, so it's very clear here that we have a way to raise this revenue of one to, and the states can do so. Uh, the federal government wanted to plug a hole in their budget and they want to go after an industry to hit them up for a lot of money, and they want to use that money to redistribute elsewhere in the economy okay. for political benefit. Well, now, that's one interesting perspective on the Constitution and, uh, and uh, all power to your federalism, but the High Court may well interpret it differently. Uh, I think it, this is a pretty uncontested area of law. Uh, the, government, the reason why the government has designed the system the way they have is it's a, it's a tax on profits, not on minerals, because you cannot actually levy a minerals tax from a federal level. It would be unconstitutional. So the but government agrees with me. What's wrong with levying a tax on the profits of the miners to actually try and... Well, we, we, we already levy from... taxes on the miners. Miners pay payroll tax like everyone else, they pay company tax like everyone else, okay. and they pay a special category of tax called royalties, which no other company or industry pays. Okay, and that ensures that the Australian people do how, get... How, how, do, how do we then account, and I'll turn to uh, George Megalogenis here, for, and, uh, and of course Duncan Wallace's uh, figures, I'm sure, are perfectly footnoted in, in the research behind this, but how do we account for the fact that we've got this massive boom in the mining industry, and yet revenue has not kept pace. Okay, the question the question is is well put in terms of the in terms of the um, bulk dollars. So you're looking at a, you're looking at a, a government that was intervening, trying to intervene belatedly to catch some of the super profits, and couldn't get the tax up. Budget goes into deficit around the same time, coming out of the GFC, and you think, well. You know, one thing equals the other, and isn't it a pity that the budget's in deficit now, and we and we may not get full return from the uh, mining boom? Now, I understand that argument, and that it's it, it's and it's technically correct in one sense, but you have to take a step back. The first phase of the boom, which is about 2003 through to 2008, uh, there was a huge income surge, and the budget caught it. Didn't catch all of it, but the budget caught a lot of it. And the problem was the previous government and the incoming Rudd government, with Wayne Swan as treasurer, decided to deliver basically all the returns from the first phase of the mining boom in tax cuts and, and handouts that were way above the odds. Basically assumed that 2% lift to GDP in company tax revenue was permanent and they handed it over to the household sector. In the short term it was probably a safe thing to do, stick it in the household sector and they stuck it in the bank and we survived the GFC. But in the long run of course the structure of the budget is not what it should be. We're not collecting enough revenue we're not collecting enough income tax, we're not collecting enough company tax, community expectations of what government spending should be is still up here. Uh, the tax base is a bit down here. There's about a two-point gap to GDP. You can't... And, and this and, is... And, and this we have a long-term issue with the tax base, though. Yeah. Is it fair to say, George, given that there were yeah. tax cuts under the previous yeah, government? Yeah, it's exactly the point. Now, a super profits tax won't be able to fix that hole. Right. Won't be able to plug that hole. Now, if, by the way, I would recommend, and James, you should start thinking about recommending this to the West Australian government. The West Australian government are whinging. They listen to us, we wish. Yeah, but they are whinging about the GST distribution, and they're getting killed on the GST distribution because it is, you know, the Grants Commission formula says, well, if, you, if you're earning quite a bit, if your revenue raising capacity from royalties is significant and, you know, uh, Victoria doesn't have a royalty rate or Tasmania doesn't have a royalty rate because it doesn't have anything to dig up, um, then they are going to get re uh, GST back off you. So they're complaining about the GST. If I were them, I'd hand everything over to Canberra. I'd give Canberra the right, and they may wait for an Abbott government to do it, I'd give them the right to tax minerals because in, in, in a, in a long-term sense for the Western Australian economy, it's a bad thing to have to have you in your hand. Um, because you're going to get done elsewhere. This, but, is, but, this yeah, is why George isn't Premier of Western Australia. <laughs> I'm going to shift the pace a bit with, with a question on the Twitter feed from Matthew Lesh, who asks, is the minimum wage stopping the Australian economy from being able to move af more effectively towards adapting to the two-speed economy? I'm not going to give that to James Patterson, Damn. because that would be a Dorothy <laughs> Dixer. Uh, I'm going to throw that to, to Neville Norman. We've had 106 years of this since the Harvester Judgment, and uh, it's an equity thing, and it's another example of where if you believe that you do your welfare by interfering with a price, you'd be happy with the results. But I think almost every economic study of all sorts of methodologies have shown that fixed prices, of which this is, or constraints on prices, has really damaged the flexibility. 
everything you seek to achieve through a minimum wage or constrained wages should more directly be done by budget measures and not by mucking up the market mechanism. That's my view on that, and I'm not a pure marketeer. Mm. Stephen Koukoulis. Yeah, there's a lot of truth in that, but at the end of the day, I, I like to look at runs on the board, and I can see that while, you know, obviously we've had a minimum wage for 106 years, um, the issue... If there was a massive failure in the way that that minimum wage has been applied, we would see that manifest itself in a very high unemployment rate. Uh, we would see it manifest itself in very poor productivity, which we may have at the moment, but that's got many causes. But the unemployment rate is still at 5% or, or thereabouts. You'd see it in the loss of living standards for the general community. And Australia is now, uh, I think, this, uh, in per capita GDP terms, I think we're the sixth richest country in the world behind Liechtenstein, Brunei, Norway, and uh, Qatar, no, no, no. Qatar, I think. Uh, Anyway, I think I think we're sixth, but the and and we're sort of on a per, on a per capita GDP basis, we're now richer than the US, 30 percent. We're richher than you know 50 percent richer than the UK. Oh, we don't uh, that confuse wealth so, and income. Okay. Yeah, no, no, but, but but the point the point is I don't see a mass. If this minimum wage was such a total stuff up, I think we wouldn't be enjoying a five percent unemployment rate and some of the highest living standards if, in the world. If the minimum if the minimum wage is supposedly an impediment towards adapting to the changing economic circumstance. Uh, or put it this way, if, if dereg deregulating wages and scrapping minimum wages is, is a panacea, why then is it that a country like the United States, which has a less regulated wages structure, has an unemployment rate of 8.2 per cent and and we're around five. It clearly isn't a panacea, is it, James Patterson? Uh, no, but it's one of many factors. So if you are really concerned about the Dutch disease, then the number one thing you want to do is make sure you have a flexible domestic economy. Uh, if you're worried about capital flight away from uh, manufacturing towards mining, then you want very low restrictions on if capital inflows from outside the country, because that will replace it. If you're worried about people leaving uh, the manufacturing industry to go and work in the mines, then you want very low restrictions on immigration, so that you can refill those positions with other people. And, if you, and you also want a lower minimum wage. Now, there is this convenient argument, which is mostly political out there, that minimum wages do not ca cause unemployment. If that was the case, why not set the minimum wage at $1,000 an hour? If that would not cause unemployment, well, that would be great for social but, equity. Okay. Everybody would. But that, that's, isn't that, that's a straw man. No, argument, it's not. No, it's not. Because, because, because at the margins, it does make a difference to employment. At, at the margins, it makes a difference. If a $15 minimum wage, uh, if a $1,000 minimum wage causes unemployment, then the change from a $15 to an $18 minimum wage also causes unemployment. It may be smaller on scale, obviously, but it's the, it's the principle that, that applies there. Is anyone, by the way, has anyone done uh, jobs growth for people on minimum wage versus every other, every other income band in the economy over the last 10 or so years? It would be a good one to try because in a funny way we're, we're, we're sort of projecting without meaning to uh, gut calls on this thing. The thing to bear in mind about the minimum wage, it's the last relic of the previous wage fixing system. Now, something that the Gillard government and the, if there's a Abbott government will have to confront is community, and I was talking before about community expectations in terms of what government should do and how much money government should spend on taxpayers' behalf, even though taxpayers don't want to cough up the cash. In areas like childcare, uh, in areas like aged care, there's going to be a big demand in the next 10 or 20 years from the community for a better quality of service. Now, these are low-paid jobs. Government and the government's just done, a, just done a deal for some of the lowest paid workers. Those wages are going to be pushed up simply, simply by public demand, not because the market says so, but because the electorate says so. So I think um, people in the labour market uh, economics fraternity need to start thinking about what is the most efficient way to deliver increased wages at the bottom without distorting um, service delivery. Because the this, thing, this is almost a non market. The other thing to bear in mind about the minimum wages is that we know that people who work on minimum wages are not what the stereotypical image in your head of a minimum wage worker is. They're often young people like me when I was at university who live in a, a family home and, and don't and I don't have to meet all my expenses. They're often the second income of a household. There, there are very few dual uh, minimum wage income households. And if you're concerned about those, there are better ways to look after their welfare. Milton Friedman's idea of a negative income tax. Steve, you get a coolest? Yeah, uh, the, the, the trade-off the trade is clear. Yeah, the $18 an hour equals 5% unemployment. $1,000 an hour would probably mean un unemployment 70%. Yes. No minimum wage or slavery would mean unemployment is zero. 
yeah, and, and but, so, but so that's so that's that's the book. So you, you take you take a you take a, a, a line. No, and where, where I, do you draw I have it? never met anyone who would voluntarily work for nothing. Uh, is anyone is anyone here going to go out and work for zero dollars an hour? Please raise your hand. I'd be very interested to meet you. You can come away with the IPA. I've got some uh, on the lunch stuffing. I'd like you to come and help me. Okay. I, I, I don't think I don't think we're going to achieve consensus here on that. Like the and we've got limited time, so I'm just going to I'm just going to move on. There's a couple of other interesting questions on the Twitter feed. Now I'm going to group them together into, a, I guess, a, a general idea. Uh, we have from Anthony Perwono, how do we reshape our resource-intensive economy into a more sustainable knowledge economy? And Left Right Oz asks, could we capitalise on the green renewable energy movement, shifting our focus away from mining? Is there a way that we can shift away from the emphasis on mining towards more more of a knowledge economics uh, and services? I, I, we do have a large service economy. It's a non in the uh, question. I mean, the fact that we might have mining growing rapidly is not due to government policy. It might be due to the absence of government policy, if you take the other view, but there's no reason why you couldn't do more for knowledge-based economy while the boom is on. It's not a choice. You can do that. But also there's this crazy idea that mining is not a knowledge-based economy. It's an incredibly technically sophisticated well, no, economy. That's, that's true. Rio Tinto has what is effectively a, a NASA you know, centre where they can um, manage a mine basically entirely remotely without any people in, in, from Perth. They can, mine, they can manage a mine a thousand kilometres away. It is an extremely technologically okay. sophisticated industry. It's a high, highly educated industry. The engineering that we feats that we are able to achieve to dig resources out of the ground is a fantastic thing and it, it's high skill based. James, that, that is demonstrable and undeniable but if we come to the issue of could we capitalise on the green renewable energy movement the, the issue there perhaps is that we have it, 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 this brings in the climate change debate we have a fossil fuel resources economy which perhaps is not paying yet the price of its externalities. Um, does it make sense to actually be imposing, uh, imposing some sort of tax, a carbon tax or, or, or an ETS, to, to force that? Now, I, might turn, I, I think Fair I know enough. what you're going to say. Fair so I'm going to turn this to Max Gordon. Very simple. We want a carbon tax. We've got a carbon tax. Maybe it's not high enough. Right. Ross is here to tell us. <laughs> and as simple as that. And as an economist, I believe if you want to achieve a purpose, you do it by general tax rather than by specific uh, interventions. Yeah. So the carbon tax is, or some sort of pricing mechanism for yeah. carbon is the answer? Yeah. Well, you've got to start with the goals. I mean, if yeah. you have serious environmental goals and you're prepared to put to side the idea that anything we do is going to make almost no effect on the world economy, we're just too small, but if you're prepared to start and do that, there is absolutely no doubt that something using the price mechanism to make people realise will work. And there's a lot of public misunderstanding about this. The real benefit of a sustained carbon price is not current consumption being diminished because households and businesses consume less. It's at the next stage when they design blast furnaces and machinery and so on. That is going to be the big thing. And that's why... Politics is a nuisance here. The right price is about $80, not 23 mm -hmm. But who's going to deliver that? I, I mean, not only because she's a magnificent Western Bulldog supporter, I think Julia Gillard, in the circumstances, and the Labor Party at the moment, has been incredibly courageous to go ahead with a politically unpopular thing. Uh, but it all comes from the goal. If you don't believe in environmental goals, you'll disagree with this. But if you do believe in environmental goals, it's difficult to argue that any alternative is going to work better than this. Okay. Stephen Kukoulis, I, I doubt very much that you would disagree with the idea that a price mechanism imposed in the form of pricing carbon is a bad thing. But what about uh, the $10 billion that they're putting to, towards this, uh, this fund for renewable energy? <laughs> Does that make any sense? Not a lot. <laughs> no, it, it, it's one where if there's uh, smart people around who are entrepreneurial, they'll take advantage of our demand for blast furnaces that run off wind power or whatever it is. There's a there's a vague case to occasionally be made. The infant industry argument that you get with yeah, but the one, old once you once but, you put a price um, on carbon, aren't yeah. you then just essentially allocating money? You're not actually going to 
You're, you're not actually going to shift the sum total. All you're going to do is give some people a handout. Sure, but at, but at the end of the day, that well, in, in a sense, if the it depends who, how the um, EGS actually works in the end. At the moment, the government's collecting the revenue. So, they, unfortunately, frankly, they didn't cut the company tax rate and uh, and they gave it all to people to spend at the Queensland poker machines or whatever the case may have been. But so that, that was a, that was a policy uh, error, if you like. But in, in terms of the development of the green industry and uh, technology that's going to be using less uh, carbon intensive ways that we consumers and other businesses want to use energy, the role of the government to encourage uh, people to think of that I think is, is very limited. It should, it should be limited. Some, some smart people work it out anyway and if they do it well they'll be very rich. George Megalogenis, is there any case for having a $10 billion clean energy finance corporation handing out money to worthy projects? Well, it depends, it depends, it depends what it is it's trying to do. Is it trying to, um, is it trying to uh, make up for the fact that the price isn't high enough? Because, in a sense, the reason why you're pricing carbon is um, to change the relative price and let the market decide what the alternate energy sources are. I mean, you, I mean, if you think it's bad enough in the past having governments pick industry winners, imagine if a government tried to pick an, in, an energy source winner. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can't think of anything more diabolical well, than, and, a, and than a minister and a, and a 28 year old um, advisor trying to tell the country. 22 year old advisor. <laughs> trying, to tell the, trying to tell the country how it's going to function for the next 50 to 100 years. I mean, that's sort of, that's sort of kill one fly down Mao Zedong um, kind of uh, behaviour. Are, are, there, are there any political advisors in Canberra who are as old as 28? Uh, very few, very few. <laughs> But uh, we also had. Well, but the, the broader premise here, that uh, that Australia could, in a, a vast landmass, drenched in sun, buffeted by wind, with waves around it, capitalise more on green renewable energy if we got the price signals right, uh, and that might offer us a future that would provide some more dynamism to the economy. Is is that one that you subscribe to, Max Corden? Yes, I do. I do. You, you can actually <laughs> say, tell us a bit more about why. If yes, you like. All I'm saying is, look, get the price right. Decide what your objectives are, which is to reduce the carbon thing, and um, uh, that's sufficient. Um, can I well, make one extra comment? It's amazing to me that a political party that is supposed to represent the interests of business and to believe in market forces, and who some of whose members have been very active in fostering free market principles, maybe even with the help of uh, your organisation, that they should be opposed to a simple price mechanism device and would prefer piecemeal protectionism. Mm. Yeah. James Patterson? Yeah, look, uh, the problem I see in this debate is that uh, listening to the scientists, the kind of cuts that they say are necessary to avert dangerous climate change. Uh, the price that we would require to achieve those cuts is higher than is politically tenable in Australia. Uh, the government cannot levy a high enough carbon price to get the desired behavioural changes to happen to meet those targets. It just won't happen. And if it's not possible in Australia, then it's not possible anywhere in the world. We're a wealthy country, we have a strong economy, and voters are resistant to the idea here. Uh, imagine how resistant they are in America, which has unemployment at 8%. Imagine how resistant they are in Europe and the rest of the world. So I don't think it's realistic to expect that governments are going to be competent enough to and, and success, politically successful enough to levy a high enough carbon price to actually achieve the reductions in carbon emissions that scientists say we need. So I think the much more rational thing to do is to prepare for the fact that the climate will change. Uh, the climate is going to change. Adaptation is the key. You'll see in the, in the next IPCC report, it's the biggest growing area of uh, reporting on scientists, is adaptation. Uh, adaptation is going to be the answer. Uh, just one little vignette on that. Uh, everybody talks about Bangladesh and the fact that it's not very high above sea level and that's a big problem. And it is a problem and they'll be hit by rising sea level rise, rises, no question. Nobody talks about Denmark. Denmark is the exact same height above sea level as Bangladesh. Or the Sylvania why, waters. The reason why we don't talk about uh, Denmark or other countries like that, European countries which have relatively the same elevation as Bangladesh, is they're wealthy countries. And they're wealthy countries who can deal with these challenges. To deal with climate change, we need Bangladesh to be as wealthy as Denmark. And the best way to do that is to foster and support economic growth with lower taxes, less regulation, free markets, free trade. Once we get those things, uh, climate change will be a much more manageable thing to deal with. I'd much rather have a much wealthier globe in 100 years' time to deal with climate change than a, than a poorer one. 
I'm just going to ask quickly, uh, we're on our nominal time limit. Uh, can we keep going or...? Yeah, I'll be yeah. I'd like... Uh, uh, well, we should charge to see if they really want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a question uh, which relates to quite a bit of what we've been discussing from Vedit Mira. Um, in according to your opinion, has Australia made the most of the terms of trade boom or will we as a nation look back upon this period with regret if not making most of once in a generational period? Stephen Kukulis? I think George touched on it from uh, the early 2000s when the first phase of the mining boom started and each time the Treasurer uh, and the Howard government prepared their budget. They had their mid-year fiscal update and they discovered they had another $10 billion in, in their revenue from a combination of both the company tax type receipts but also stock markets were booming then house prices were booming. We had an asset price boom globally and Australia was part of that. So they were collecting all that money and the budget surpluses when you look back in history are extremely impressive. They're one and a half percent of GDP. They're, they're big numbers. Uh, the, the question is implicitly should they have been 3 or 4% of GDP and should we not have seen this range of tax cuts from about 03 to 07 under Howard and then 8 to 2010 under, uh, under Rudd and the answer is probably we should not have seen those. It comes to questions of sovereign wealth funds. I'm not a big fan of sovereign wealth funds but if, if, if you choose to have a sovereign wealth fund that's not a bad policy mistake to be making that if you've got the government sector pumping cash into a future fund type concept not ideal, but it, there's a lot worse things you can do with your money, like giving it to us consumers who go and bid up house prices and spend it. Uh, so I suspect we're probably going to look back at this, and even though we've got low levels of government debt, even though the economy is very prosperous, I suspect it would have been nicer and more desirable to have a chunk, probably, uh, uh, you know, I've roughly worked this out in the past, but something like 10% of GDP right now, which is 150, $160 billion, put away somewhere else over and above what we've got. In a, in a broader sense, then, merely revenue, have we stuffed the mining boom? Uh, I'd argue that we're getting a second shot at getting it right because we share an assumption on the table here that we've got another five or ten years to live with this thing and don't underestimate, especially once you've been through a couple of governments, which we probably will go through very rapidly, that you don't get a group very quickly in Canberra in the next five or so years that are going to want to um, get off the polling cycle and get on the long-term thinking cycle. And, uh, you know, I'm a little bit more optimistic, uh, simply because we've had it demonstrated to us that, uh, that we missed an opportunity the first time around. So... You can tell George is an idealist. The last time we had that, in all honesty, was the Hawke government. Now, that's a little difficult for me to say because I was an official advisor of the whole of the Fraser government. Mm. And um, no, it, it, no, no, well, Fraser didn't listen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The amazing thing <laughs> is that from the inside, I can tell you, and I hope there'll be a time to write some of this at some point, that Fraser knocked back most of the ideas that people like John Hewson and I were putting up, just knocked them back, radical things that he could have done, he had the political power to do it, and yet he had the guts to do that Vietnamese thing, mm. which was we just out of character. You need to understand that. It really was out of character. And he pioneered that. And then that was followed by a Hawke government. And Hawke was a trade union leader and people said there'd be rampant inflation and so on. It was probably economically the best period of economic management and a lot of long-term reforms in superannuation. Now, my answer to this question is in three parts. Number one, of course, it's obvious. We'll look back in 10 years' time and say so much we could have done and we didn't do it. My second part is, insofar as the political constraints and short cycles of government and the threat... I mean, we've got an unelected government at the moment. Um, that's, it's the government, but, I mean, they didn't win the last election... And it's really difficult for that. And let's hope, for the sake of long-term policy, I'm not being party political about this, if there is a clarity that a new government elected with a good majority will actually do something in the long-term side. If that doesn't happen, 
it's because we've got our democratic political system and I think we just have to live with that. But the third part of the question, if it doesn't happen, because we as economists have failed in the media and otherwise to try and get more long-term issues up instead of the media fascination with what the hell happened to Wall Street last night, that's the standard dominating thing, then that's a great pity. And this is the time now to try and get the sort of issues that this Economic Student Society has boldly put forward long-term issues. This is the time to get them up. Then if we fail on that one, then that's our fault. Max Corden, just briefly, and yeah. then I'm going to ask for more questions. I want to add to the point as follows. The reason the Hawke government was brilliantly successful in bringing about reforms that would not have been successful in a referendum, say, or in public opinion polls, was that the opposition more or less supported them or didn't strongly oppose them. It was on the hard and the hard primary, right? Now, unfortunately, we now have an opposition that is grossly irresponsible. Yeah. And I think we'd have to do something about our oppositions, as well as governments, because you can't get things done that are not greatly popular uh, if the opposition immediately makes use of this unpopularity of ideas and stops everything. So. I'm not a fan of the present leader of the opposition, frankly. <laughs> so, so is that take, take out a contract on Tony? Was that the suggestion? <laughs> um, questions from the audience? Chap here. Okay, just for the recording, 457 visas and Gina Reinhardt getting a whole lot of workers in from overseas to service her mines in WA. Uh, we'll turn to you, Neville Norman. Yeah, well, I, I've been out of the country for six or eight weeks and I'm only here for a short time, but I did follow that when it came. And um, I think you have to separate your views about the substance of this area from any personal views you might feel about Gina and the family disputes and the rest of it. And frankly, I can't, so I'm a very biased answer. But I don't... I, I think that there is a case for um, experimenting, at least, with some of those visas and helping, because there are so many distortions in the labour market. I don't think there can be a generic policy of trying to use guest workers and supplementaries and so on. But I, I, I am a little bit sympathetic towards the idea because I think there are some specific shortages and I'll back it up with one anecdote. I was in Perth about eight weeks ago. I was in a hotel that my uh, sponsors paid $490 for a crappy room for, room only, and the air conditioning didn't work and they moved me to another room because they said it'd take six months to get an engineer to fix it because they were all in the mining boom. So that's the reason I think we do have a, we do have a skill shortage problem. And when you go to Western Australia, you see this two-speed economy thing as such. I mean, that would not happen here because we've got engineers. Yeah, it's talk about thing. the price mechanism, $5 for a cup of coffee in Perth. No, no, and people still pay. Look, it's a great idea. I think if there's this skill shortage, Australians don't want to go there and work in the mines. Right. Either they don't want to go there or they don't have the skills to go there. And if we don't encourage those sorts of fly-in and temporary you know, a couple of years to have these people working there, that stuff will be left in the ground for way too long. So it's that sort of flexibility in how you exploit your economy and how you maximise growth, but, so to me, seems a pretty, but pretty should, simple should we, issue. Should we have a situation where the market rates in, in these industries are very high and you can have a visa which allows people to be brought in on a minimum award rate? Well... Uh, uh, I assume if they want to come here for that particular wage rate, right? uh, it's not... not By totally definition, it's a market rate if someone yeah. accepts it. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Question Great. here. Uh, 
part of the problem on this is the way that Australia does its skilled immigration is that it lists the immigration department in its wisdom, decides, looks around the economy and decides which industries have skill shortages and it draws up a list and if you're on that list, if you're a hairdresser or a mechanic, then you get to come into Australia and fill the skills shortage. Now, I don't have a great deal of confidence in bureaucrats in the immigration department to decide which industries need labour and which ones don't. And you find with these lists is they put hairdressers on and anyone who wants to come to Australia trains to be a hairdresser so they can come to Australia. Then all of a sudden we've got a surplus of hairdressers, so hairdressers come off and mechanics go on. Then you find we have too many mechanics and mechanics come off. I would much rather have, if you're going to have skilled immigration, rather than have the government deciding which kind of skills are better than others, you let the market decide, you have a minimum standard, you have to have X number of years of qualifications or whatever, and anyone who meets that standard can come, and they will come if they can get a job, and if they can't get a job, they probably won't come, particularly if they don't get welfare when they're here. Yeah. Now, the anecdote, though, and the anecdote you might be referring to, uh, is, not, is, is a market failure imposed by, by a club called the AMA, and there's a very difficult thing in the health area, uh, and this country has, especially with an ageing population, have some, some, well, all Western societies have some specific needs. We have them especially, you know, by the time you get to Queensland and, and you're uh, letting doctors in under the wire for the wrong reasons and then, you, and then you're closing, then you're closing, you're erecting a barrier again and then you're telling people to do something else. This isn't market failure, this isn't government policy failure, this is a fact, this is a capture by a trade union and, uh, and uh, I think... I think you're probably right on that anecdote. I was at a meeting the other day, which I can't discuss because we're under Chatham House, but that was the first thing that was brought to the table, that, yeah. the, that, there's, a, that there's a blockage there. The doctors... The only but, sorry, not just, not just in the health sector, but also in the research, in the science and research sector as well. That we, got, we could build a, a terrific brain economy in Australia because the dollar allows us to bid for some of the smartest people on the planet in the short term, but you've got a whole lot of institutional uh, uh, resistance to it when I'd let it rip. The doctor's one of the few unions still allowed to run a closed shop. A question up the back. Back to the O'Connor's two-speed economy. Uh, vertical fiscal imbalance isn't the sexiest topic in the world, but it's one that affects Australia. Uh, should the state be given more responsibility towards uh, you know, collecting their own revenue? They could take it, except they don't want to take it. So at some point, at some point, federal state financial reform is almost a, it's almost the next big thing in in the reform game. You wouldn't get a single vote out of it, um, and in fact, you, you'd get most journalists not understanding the intricacies of it. But at some point, it's going to need to be done. Uh, and in fact, I'm more for a competitive federalism model. I, it's not going to be wall-to-wall -wall Labor governments because they didn't pull it off, and it won't be wall-to-wall -wall coalition governments. I think at some point. The Australian population has to has to has to split the ticket again, whether they go federal labour and coalition in the states, or coalition federal and, and labour in the states. And at that point, people people in the system say it's time to talk turkey on uh, federal state financial reform. I'd, I'd love to see income taxing powers return to the states, but Malcolm Fraser actually did offer it back to the states and they refused it. And uh, the current generation of state politicians are probably even less likely to, to take it up. They've got a great situation. Uh, if ever they can't do anything, it's the federal government's fault for not giving them enough money. They don't have to raise unpopular taxes on their people. Um, it's, it's a great system for them, all care and no responsibility. They just have to deliver services in a vaguely competent way and they'll rule for about 50 50% of the time. Uh, it's, it's a really dodgy system. No, no, no. All this is... There's an easier way. The only solution to vertical fiscal imbalance is to do what every thinking Australian does and hasn't the guts to do and what privately almost every politician tells me. Get rid of one level of government and that's the states. And that is the answer to it. And yeah, that solves so many Stop problems. Stop the states. <laughs> Take that to the next election. Okay. Um, another question? Yeah. I've got an interesting question about uh, policy reform in terms of education. We'll, and, we'll, um, we'll be the judge of that. Okay, so <laughs> uh, if you were hypothetically in power at some stage, and looking currently, would you have the opportunity to implement the Gonski reforms? Would you implement them? Um, to what extent would you would or Gonski. Is it Gonski or is it realistic? 
Uh, there's good and bad things about Konski, uh, but it has a $6 billion price tag, uh, so it's not going to happen in the short term. Uh, that's the truth of the matter, particularly when the government also wants to introduce a national disability insurance scheme, which has a 6 to $8 billion price tag. Uh, so the reality is it won't happen. Uh, personally, I'm a federalist. I would rather see states controlling the education system. I'd rather see competition between the states for what is the best funding mechanism. Um, I generally don't like things being done on a federal level, so instinctively I worry about Konski, but there's some, some good aspects to it. Stephen Kukoulis. Yeah, it, it's expensive, um, but inevitably we've got to, uh, if, if we're going to maximise our wealth or use our current wealth to maximise our prospects in 10 and 20 years' time, you've, you've got to spend money on education. I don't think every, every study that I've seen, probably not as many as others at this table have seen, on the correlation between educational attainment and living standards and wealth or however you want to measure it. Is, is almost perfect. Well, so well, well, if you want to be a rich, decent, healthy uh, society, you've got to train but people it's not starting just the, in the amount. School. It's not just yeah. the dollar amount. Yeah, it's, it's where it's dollars, spent. It's, it's what for, for, for three decades in Australia, we have spent billions of dollars trying to get class sizes down in the naive view that a small class means better quality education. Now, the Grattan Institute put out a wonderful report about a year ago completely debunking this. It has no bear, bearing relationship. And intuitively, we should know this is the case. When you think back to your high school experience, do you remember the smallest class you were in or do you remember the best teacher you had? Would you rather the government is spending money on getting more of the good teachers by paying them higher wages and put up with an extra couple of kids in the class, which, or would you rather have a class of 15 people? Which, it, which, is like it, which takes us beyond Gonski, and I, I think the, the bottom line in Gonski is that the dollars aren't going where they're needed, and that's what needs to be changed. But we've run out of time. I'd like to say a warm thank you to the panel for a very, very stimulating to debate, and to the audience for great questions. <laughs> Um, hi guys, so I'm Dean from the Economic Student Society of Australia and there's a few thank yous that I need to do before we end the night. Now firstly I would like to thank our sponsors which Karen mentioned before. Um, thanks to the audience here physically and also online via Twitter for your discussion and involvement. I'd, like to, I'd love to thank my committee, or our committee, including the President here, Karen Lee, Brendan Law, and there's about 24 of you scattered either in the, in the audience or around this whole um, brilliant old arts, so I'd like to thank them for all their hard work. It's, it's been brilliant. Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank the panel for a fantastic discussion, especially to Stephen Kukoulos and Stephen Long flying down from Canberra and Sydney, especially for this event. So thank you very much, and we have a token, small token for our gratitude.